Good morning and welcome to our service this morning. Uh, welcome to everyone who's here this morning in the church and welcome if you're watching live or catching up uh, via YouTube. It's uh, hard to convey this if you're not in the building, but uh, for Corona, uh, for COVID standards, we've got a very good turnout, which is lovely to see. We've been trying to encourage uh, you all to, you know, to come along and book because most Sundays we have had um, some spare capacity and the good news is that from um, next week we'll be able to use balcony, the, the regulations are changing so again we'll have quite a bit more spaces for people to sit uh, and you know be here so that's wonderful. We're very thankful that we have the ability to live stream and this is good for people who are you know housebound uh, all year round and also you know, if, you, if you're not yet in a position to come out, and it's obviously seen us through the past year, but we are also very grateful for the ability to gather and just to see each other and um, just to worship God here in this place. The uh, one other announcement I wanted to make is that uh, Christian Aid Week will go ahead this year in May, from May the 10th till May the 16th, and last year it was done by the e-envelopes only, and we will be using these and encouraging people to give in that way. It's quite convenient, you can give electronically, but um, it is now, again, permissible to go door to door with envelopes. So the Christian Aid uh, Committee, that's obviously from the different churches in the village, have decided that we'll target the 20, 25 most um, profitable, that <laughs> uh, sounds a bit bad, um, streets that normally return the most uh, in the collections. And so all the, the regular collectors for those streets have been approached to see if they feel you know, happy to, to do that this year. And there's been some that can't do that. So then others have been approached. If you normally are a collector and you, would, you haven't been asked yet and you would like to help, or if you don't normally do this, but would be happy to, to go and post out the envelopes in a street or part of a street and then go back a couple of times if you're able to, um, to see if people have the envelopes if they want to give to Christian Aid. That'd be wonderful. Let uh, Jenny Durwood know. I've also put her phone number in the email that's gone out this morning. So if you want to contact her, if you want to volunteer to do this, that'd be wonderful. Um, last weekend, there was two boys, Robbie um, Watson, who's one of our own young people, and um, Cameron, I've forgotten his surname, <laughs> lives down the road there. Uh, the two boys for Boys Brigade took part with uh, the Kilt Walk, and they raised to, together, I think about 800 pounds for Christian aid, so that was really good. I'll have some pictures of them uh, probably in the next Lich Gate. Well, we've come here to worship God. The theme for this morning will be around sacrifice because I'll be exploring what the meaning of the cross is, and I'm focusing on sacrifice. <clears throat> in Psalm 116, we're encouraged to bring God a sacrifice of thanksgiving and lift up his name in the presence of his people. So let us do that this morning. We're going to listen to hymn 39, God the Lord, the King Almighty. Oh 
was explained last week, I want to look at um, the meaning of the cross for a number of weeks, uh, what actually it happened that Jesus, uh, what actually it means that Jesus died on the cross. And there's lots of different images in the Bible to describe the meaning of the cross. And we, in a kind of quick way, looked at some of those last week. And I mentioned some of the questions we might have around these images. One probably most familiar is the idea of sacrifice and uh, that Jesus somehow was offered as a sacrifice for our sins on the cross. So that's the image we'll be looking at this morning. And the reading that will go with that is Hebrews chapter 10. And Caitlin is going to come and read to us verses 1 to 22. Christ's sacrifice once for all. The law is only a shadow of the good things that are coming, not the realities themselves. For this reason, it can never by the same sacrifices repeated endlessly year after year, make perfect those who draw near to worship. Otherwise, would they not have stopped being offered? For the worshippers would have been cleansed once for all and would no longer have felt guilty for their sins. But those sacrifices are an annual reminder of sins. It is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away their sins. Therefore, when Christ came into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offerings you did not desire, but a body you prepared for me. With burnt offerings and sin offerings you were not pleased. Then I said, Here I am, it is written, about me in the school, I have come to do your will, my God. First he said, sacrifices and offerings, burnt offerings and sin offerings, you did not desire, nor were you pleased with them, though they were offered in accordance with the law. Then he said, here I am, I have come to do your will. He sets aside the first to establish the second, and by that will we have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Day after day, every priest stands and performs his religious duties. Again and again, he offers the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when this priest had offered for all time one sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. And since that time, he waits for his enemies to be made his footstool. For by one sacrifice he made perfect for ever those who are being made holy. The Holy Spirit also testifies us about this. First he says, this is the covenant I will make with them. After the, that time, says the Lord, I will put my laws in their hearts and I will write them on their minds. Their sins and lawless acts I will remember no more. And when these have been forgiven, sacrifice for sin is no longer necessary. A call to persevere in faith. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way opened for us through the curtain, that is, his body. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart, and with the full assurance that faith brings, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty consequence and having our bodies washed with pure water. Thank you, Caitlin. And we give thanks to God for this reading from his holy word. Um, I wanted to show you a, a picture of a painting that made quite an impression on me, I think it's more than 20 years ago. It is called Agnus Dei, which means Lamb of God, by Francisco, um, funny surname, de Zurbaran, I hope that's correctly pronounced, Francisco de Zurbaran. Um, it was likely painted in the 
1640s. It's a very simple painting, really, uh, aside from being quite exquisite in real life. It's just a lamb, a young sheep, bound, waiting to be sacrificed. Um, it was more than 20 years ago when I studied in Durham for a year and I went on a trip to, down to London. There was an exhibition in the National Gallery which was called Seeing Salvation. And uh, I think it was 2000 that that was on. And uh, I decided to go to the National Gallery to see this exhibition which was trying to do in visual way what I'm trying to do in the sermon series, i.e explore all the different ways in which the meaning of Jesus' death uh, and what it accomplished is, has been portrayed in art through the centuries. Uh, it was a very uh, interesting and powerful exhibition which was visited by millions. And I bought the book that went with the exhibition so I could just you know, look back over those pictures sometimes. For example, the famous image of um, Jesus on the cross uh, the Salvador Dali painting that's in Glasgow, uh, that one was on the cover of the book and was kind of on all the posters for the exhibition. And there was lots of images of Jesus on the cross and weeping people and, you know, all sorts of very kind of uh, explicit images from the past, so ever, uh, however many centuries. Um, but to me, actually, it was this quite simple and not very large painting of the lamb that just struck a note. And in one sense, it's nothing makes it obvious that this is about Jesus. And yet, because we're sort of familiar with the, the language of the Bible and both the New Testament and the Old Testament, that image of Jesus as the Lamb of God, as the sacrifice given for our sins, is one we're probably familiar with. I still don't entirely know why this image struck me so much. I guess it was the sense of peace and resignation uh, that is it in that picture. It's also very sad <laughs> to see that pure and innocent lamb just waiting for his end. Thank you, uh, Lois. We'll take it down now. So today I want to think what, does, what we make of this metaphor or image for, of sacrifice in the 21st century and what it tells us about the relationship, our relationship to God and Jesus. I think I'm going to need two sermons for this, so we'll probably have to come back to the, you know, today to, or, or the current relevance of that image next week. But today I wanted to focus in on how can we understand this better against the Old Testament background. Because in the Old Testament, we know that the people of God were commanded to bring sacrifices, animals, lamb. Uh, if people were poor, they could bring pigeons or other birds. They also brought grain offerings, sometimes wine offerings. And so if you want to learn more about these sacrifices that were commanded to be offered in the temple on different times of the year, and also the daily uh, sacrifices that went on in first the tabernacle and then later in the temple in Jerusalem. You can read about that in Leviticus in particular. And the book of Leviticus makes clear that there were sacrifices for expressing and maintaining the sort of day-to-day -day normal relations with God, maintaining good relationships, such as there were the burnt offerings, grain offerings, and fellowship offerings. In a burnt offering, an animal was killed and burned on the altar in its entirety. All of it was for God. You might offer a burnt offering if you wanted to say thanks for something good that has happened to you or a blessing received. A uh, grain offering was literally that, an offering of grain, but only a portion was put on the altar and the larger part was then kept for the priests to make bread from and that was what you know what fed them who were totally in the service of God and then there was the peace or fellowship offering where they would bring meat of some kind uh, an animal of some kind and a part was put on the altar and burnt and a part was given to the priests again for their uh, food 
and then a part was eaten or returned to the family that had brought it, and they would share it, and it would be a fellowship uh, offering, a fellowship meal for them to kind of enjoy with God, if you like. So those types, those sacrifices were not related to sin or apology or anything. They were just an expression of love and thankfulness to God, the acknowledgement that everything we receive comes from God and that we give back to God from that. You could maybe compare it to, I know, buying a bunch of flowers or a special uh, gift of jewelry or something else that means something to a person, and it's, it's to maintain a relationship and to express love. Then there was a separate category of sacrifices that were for repairing the relationship with God. So these were called sin offerings and guilt offerings. And they are offered as gestures of repentance and regret. Now, it's quite clear in many places in the prophets and even in the psalm that we just heard Helen saying earlier that if it was just an outward action, we, we came with our offerings, with our sin offerings, but meanwhile, you know, our hearts weren't in it and we carried on um, sinning against God's commandments, then, you know, it wasn't effective. You couldn't get away with just an outward sacrifice whilst your heart was, and, and your behavior didn't match. But generally, these, these sacrifices for sin and guilt were a way of restoring the relationship with God. And then the priest would declare that you were forgiven uh, and that you were put right with God again. One, again, maybe like uh, yeah, sometimes we give someone a gift or we do something nice for them because we're sorry and we're trying to repair a relationship. But if we're just buying a bunch of flowers and meanwhile carry on uh, with our selfish behavior, then that gift hasn't really accomplished anything. In fact, it makes it nearly worse. So that's the way that these sin or guilt offerings were offered. They were a way of expressing repentance and regret a commitment to changing your life, and also a recognition, particularly the annual and the regular offerings that were required, that I guess even if we're not fully conscious of it, we continually um, rebel against God and turn away from Him in our hearts and in our actions. So the, both these two types, of cat, uh, two types of sacrifices, the ones that were just expressing gratitude and thanks and fellowship with God, and the other ones, the sin offerings, both of these were prescribed by God as a way of keeping the relationship with God um, in good health. The final thing to, to say about the kind of physicality of that is when these animals, well, if there are animals brought, they would be um, killed, but the blood would be collected, and the blood had a special significance because the priests would then take that and sprinkle it against the the altar that was in the temple, and it was thought to cleanse both the, the altar and the, and the items that were sprinkled with blood. Sometimes it was even the clothes of the priests. Um, they were thought to cleanse from impurity. Now, that's a strange notion to us, probably. I don't know if you're uh, planning any cleaning rituals that involve blood, probably not, but that was this, the spiritual and the ritual symbol, symbolism of blood was that it was cleansing. In Leviticus, it also makes clear that the blood was considered to be the life of the animal, and the life belonged to God. So the Jews weren't allowed to eat any, eat or drink blood, so you couldn't have um, whatever, black pudding, that type of product, because that's made with blood, because the blood was, um, it was seen to be the life of the, of the animal or, or of a human, and it belonged to God, so it had a special uh, status. Right, so that's a bit about the, the Old Testament and, and also then up that, you know, right up until when Jesus is living and working, that's, that's what, you know, the religion was of his day. And that's not even unique to Judaism because most religions around them, most nations around them would have offered sacrifices. And to us, it's a weird concept uh, and maybe even objectionable, but to all the nations around them, both you know, in, in the early days when Abraham would offer sacrifices to God and later when 
Moses received all these instructions, you know, that's what most religions and most nations around them would have been doing. They would offer sacrifices to gods that they believed in, and they might have done this if they wanted to make sure they got a good harvest or to give thanks to their gods. Um, they might try to change the gods' minds if there were bad things on the way or uh, they were worried and all these things, you know, the sacrifices then are the, the thing to do. Now, in the, we know from the Greeks and the Romans, so that those cultures are around at the time of the New Testament, that sacrifices were offered to avert the wrath of the gods. So there were ways of trying to, you know, make the gods uh, a bit more positively uh, inclined towards the people. That is not really what is going on in, in the old, uh, or in, in Judaism, but uh, that's perhaps a matter for debate. The, it's quite clear in the Old Testament that God isn't a machine, so you can't just, you know, slaughter a whole bunch of cows and hope that you will win this battle. God is, is free, and God is autonomous, so it's a, it's a live relationship, and God, you can't just, you know, put X in and Y will come out. You can't guarantee that God will help you. God will help you if he wants to help you. But your sacrificing can be an expression of your commitment to God. Now, some cultures even had human sacrifice, but this was strongly forbidden in Judaism. And in the Bible, it's condemned as abhorrent to God. And there is, however, this rather puzzling story in Genesis of Abraham being asked to sacrifice Isaac, his son. And I looked it up uh, on the 30th of August last summer. It's now on, still on YouTube. I preached on that story, and it is, of course, quite troubling to us. And I think I tried to explain it at the time. So if you want to look back, that's on YouTube. You need to go right down to the 30th of August. Um, so... That's a bit about the background in the Old Testament and the culture and, uh, around them and, and also what Jesus would be, you know, what was happening at the time that Jesus was there. And this, he, you know, his parents brought sacrifices, he would have brought sacrifices uh, and so on. And yet, the passage we've read this morning in Hebrews suggests that Jesus was the final sacrifice and the perfect sacrifice after which no more animal sacrifices in the temple are needed. In the book of Hebrews, we don't really actually know who wrote it, but the person is clearly writing to a Jewish or Christian Jewish uh, audience because they can understand all the references to these sacrifices, to the temple, to the holiest uh, part of the temple and all that. But in uh, verse 10 of chapter 10, the writer says this, we have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. We have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. So he's clearly drawing a parallel with the sacrifices in the temple and saying now Jesus is the perfect sacrifice that's been offered to God to make us holy, to cleanse us from our sins and to make it possible that we can come into God's presence. The type of sacrifice that the writer seems to be thinking of is the, the sin offering. It's the, the offering that's given in order to restore relationship with God and to achieve forgiveness from sins. When we have been forgiven, when our sins have been cleansed, then we are holy. And holy means set aside, able to be in the presence of God, made pure, ready and able be in God's presence. Now, the writer of Hebrews doesn't explain how exactly that works, um, you know, what's actually literally happening, but that is really, I guess, the same for the sacrifices in the Old Testament. They are a way, a routine, a ritual to engage in, and if you're engaged in it with your heart and all your mind and all your, you know, your commitment, then it works, uh, because God accepts these ac sacrifices as such and then forgives. And now here it's Jesus who is presented as a perfect sacrifice. 
In the Old Testament and, and in the hymn that was sung this morning, we can also, also hear, however, that in a way it was acknowledged that the actual sacrifices of animals itself can't really accomplish anything because God doesn't need, you know, God doesn't need to eat as some other religions thought you needed to feed the gods. <laughs> you need to keep them happy and, you know, give them some nice tasty roast to, to keep them well inclined. Well, that's clearly not the case for God in the Bible. God didn't need these sacrifices because he owned, had created all of the world. And yet they were the way that he had suggested his people offered their love and commitment to him. In a lot of the, the books of the prophets, you can see the criticism against the worship and the offering of sacrifices when the people haven't actually properly repented and changed their ways. Um, in Jeremiah and in um, uh, Isaiah, you've got lots of rants against that kind of worship, and it said God detests your offerings, you, the sacrifices you bring, but actually then you go out, you leave the temple, and you go back to being, uh, you know, abusing your neighbor and extortion, and uh, that's just not what I want, and in this way it won't work. Your sins are not actually forgiven. Never mind how many cows you've brought me, this is not going to work. The underlying problem that the sacrifices couldn't deal with was the condition of people's hearts. And God had already promised that um, he would, one day would come and sort this out by changing people's hearts, writing the Torah on their hearts and changing them from the inside out. And now that Jesus has appeared and the Spirit then later is poured out over the people, this is how God is going to change people's hearts and Jesus, then, is the only perfect sacrifice that can fully wipe out the sin and the rebellion of the people. Now, I'm going to cut a bit short what I've written. If you want to get the full script, then uh, you can email me and I'll, I'll send it to you. So, in Hebrews, as I said, Jesus is presented as the perfect sacrifice, and after that, no, nothing and nobody else is needed. He then also flips the image and says, Jesus is also the priest who comes to offer the sacrifice, which makes clear that Jesus wasn't just an innocent victim who was, you know, who this happened to, but Jesus himself voluntarily came into this role. God himself has provided this sacrifice. Now, I think we probably still have lots of questions, and if you do have them, please email me or let me know in some way, because then I can hopefully address these next week, and particularly, as you may wonder, what, you know, what, what, what do we do with this image in the 21st century? But for now, to end the sermon, I want to just make clear what, what the Hebrews, the writer of the Hebrews' main point is. We might still find this imagery of sacrifice strange and alien, but the point that the writer wants to make is this, and you can read these in verses 19 to 21, at the end of the passage that we read. It's this, because what Jesus did on the cross, we can now come into the presence of God without guilt or fear. That is the main thing. Even if we don't understand exactly how that works, we are reassured by Jesus' death on the cross, that we can come into God's presence, the holy God, no matter what we've done or how we've strayed or what goes on in our hearts, we can come to God if we come with repentance and know that Jesus' sacrifice on the cross is enough. We are forgiven and we are free. We can come freely and courageously into the presence of God because Jesus, his death, has reconciled us with God. And really the only response to that is to make use of the freedom we've been given and to go to God with our gratitude and our thankfulness to not waste the opportunity to come into God's presence and not to focus on our guilt and our sin, but to know that we have been cleansed. We're going to listen to a music video which uses that image of the sacrifice. It's called um, Once Again by Matt Redman and it's performed by the Stonely Worship Band.
Jesus Christ, I think upon your sacrifice. Jesus Christ, I think upon your sacrifice, you became nothing, poured out to death. Many times I wondered at your gift of life, not in that place once again. Once again, once again I look upon the cross where you died, humbled by your mercy and I'm broken inside. Once again I thank you, once again I Now you are exalted to the highest place. I have um, an announcement to make that uh, the husband of Elizabeth Lyle, Alec Lyle, died yesterday morning. So we will remember the Lyle family in our prayers. Let us pray. <clears throat> Jesus, you are both the perfect sacrifice and the great high priest. You have gone before us and opened up a way for us to follow. Your body has made us holy, cleansed from sin. And now we are able to enter into the presence of the Father. As a high priest, you mediate for us with God. And we ask you now, intercede for us as we bring our requests before the throne of grace. We give thanks this week that further relaxations of the COVID restrictions are possible. And we pray for those who work in hospitality and retail, who will be pleased to see their places open once again. We know many are still worried if their businesses will make it through this season, and some will have already folded in the past year. 
Lord, ease our troubled minds and give us peace. We give thanks for schools that have now been fully open, and we pray for the teachers and staff that have had to cope with so many changes and stress <clears throat> in the past year, and that are now responsible for setting and grading assessments for the exam years. We pray for the pupils who are having to adjust again and especially for those in exam years who have missed out on so much teaching and are now concerned about the assessments ahead. Lord, ease our troubled minds and give us peace. We pray for the upcoming elections. We give thanks that we live in a democracy where we can vote and have our voices heard in a peaceful manner. We pray for people to feel that this is indeed the case and that all politicians will have the best interests of the nation at heart, especially for those people who are most at risk of being overlooked or suffer from the decisions made. Lord, ease our troubled minds and give us peace. We give thanks that in our country the vaccine rollout is continuing swiftly and efficiently and that the pandemic seems under control. We pray for the many countries in Europe and around the world where this is not the case. We pray especially for Brazil and for India, where a terrible second wave is sweeping the nation. Lord, ease our troubled minds and give us peace. We pray for those young and old who are grieving or facing death and loss at this time. We pray this morning for the Lyle family as they mourn the loss of a husband, father, and grandfather, Alec. Surround them with your comfort and love. Lord, ease our troubled minds and give us peace. In the silence, we bring our own prayers to your throne. Jesus, we thank you that you intercede for us. Spirit, we know that you pray the prayers we cannot even utter. In Jesus' name, amen. Our final hymn this morning is 426, All Heaven Declares. Go from here with your consciences clean, with your sins forgiven. Thanks to Jesus, the Lamb of God, and the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with us now and forevermore. Amen. <laughs>